It's a new and culturally peculiar idea that human sexuality is all about intimacy and pleasure, but not necessarily about babies. It's been understood throughout the history of humanity that one of the primary intentions of the union of a man and a woman was to create a family with children. The more the better. But today, all bets are off. And personal gratification is the highest goal of the modern person. Additionally, as Christians, we will face this argument. Jesus never said anything about homosexuality, but instead was all about love and non-judgmentalism. That is patently not true. Jesus was unequivocal in saying that to understand marriage and the sexual union, we must go back to the beginning and see how God created humanity and for what purpose. And when he was asked, and it's recounted for us in both Matthew 19 and Mark chapter 10, when he was asked about this, Jesus holds up the creation story in Genesis, not as a, not as a quaint Sunday school lesson, but as authoritative. He reminds us that God created mankind, male and female, and that the union of marriage that God created and ordains is for a husband and wife to come together in physical union, one flesh. Now here's where I'm starting here today. We're starting a study of the book of Leviticus this morning. And this is the biggest argument that you and I will face when we make a stand, for example, for biblical marriage, biblical sexuality. The, the biggest argument that we will face is this. Well, Jesus never said anything about that. False. He specifically said in Matthew chapter 5, verses, uh, verse 17, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Well, then, then why do you wear cotton blended clothes? It is written, you shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. And many Christians are stumped at that point. I, 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 well, I just think it's wrong. Christians today often have no idea what to do with the law of God. We love to see Ten Commandments posted in public places like courthouses, and yet we break Commandments numbers two and four without giving it a second thought, saying something like, well, well, God knows my heart, which is the problem. And so we're beginning of this project, you could call it today, um, for the foreseeable future, I'm going to be preaching through the book of Leviticus which is essentially a list of God's laws. And they're largely, the book of Leviticus is largely laws pertaining to worship and holiness. Now here's why I want to preach through this book. I gave you the example of marriage and sexuality to begin with because that's where we find ourselves in this um, moment of history. But this moment will pass eventually. And yet God's word stands for a really long time, forever. God's word stands forever. And we need to be equipped to, in, uh, in the words of Jude, we need to be equipped to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And before long, you're gonna see Leviticus as an integral part of the faith. But beyond that, let me give you three reasons why I wanna preach through Leviticus. First, this is pretty obvious, and it could be applied really to any book of the Bible. <clears throat> I'm committed to declaring to you the whole counsel of God. That's what Paul did for the Ephesians. He, he told, told them this. He uses that phrase in Acts 20, verse 27, the Ephesian elders. We also know that all Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture 
is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. But why this book? Well, the second reason that I want to preach Leviticus is because it is essential to understanding the meaning of the incarnation and the gospel, the Christ in the flesh and the good news that he has died for our sins and risen. Let me prove that to you. I can prove to you in one statement, one New Testament statement, why I believe that the book of Leviticus is crucial to understanding both the incarnation and the gospel. It's a statement that John the Baptist made, and it would, without the book of Leviticus, this statement would make no sense to anyone. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We're going to see how that is true, how that statement is true as the book unfolds. And then the third reason that I want to preach through the book of Leviticus is that we as a church especially in a world gone mad, we as a church need to be committed to understanding true holiness. Not holiness as uh, we think of sometimes in the holiness movement, which says that you can achieve some level of sinless perfection in this life, but holiness as the Bible actually teaches. The Apostle Peter charges us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. He says, therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Do you know where that's written? It's written five times in the book of Leviticus. Five times in the book of Leviticus. Be holy as I am holy. And when we get there, because we are committed to understanding true holiness, we will understand these things, is my prayer. So as we begin this study, we're going we're gonna to actually start this morning in Psalm 24. Turn to Psalm 24. We're going to sort of um, dance around Leviticus a little bit today for a while before we actually land in chapter 1, verse 1, uh, next Lord's Day. But let me read Psalm 24. It's very similar to the psalm that Ben read for our call to worship, which was Psalm 15. The 24th Psalm, I'm going to read these 10 verses together and then we'll pray. This is a Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let's pray together. Father, what we don't have today, I pray that you would give us what we need. I pray that you would see that we have. Father, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, help us to understand that we might see and behold the mighty works of our God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that one of the keys to understanding the book of Leviticus can be found in this psalm. And specifically, in the answer to the question that is posed by the psalmist in verse 3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? 
Now, if you just kind of let your eyes roll down over Psalm 24, it's actually pretty simple to find a kind of an outline in the psalm. So in the first two verses, you can see God as creator and therefore as sustainer and, and sovereign over all things. And we know what happened following creation, right? Sin, curse, banishment from the garden. Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24 says, Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned away to guard the way to the tree of life. Turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. But there's a curious detail in the creation account and specifically about the garden itself that we often just read over. And I don't think we, I don't think we often understand the significance of this. So, so listen to Genesis chapter 2, verses 10 to 14. This description of the garden. Genesis 2, verse 10 says, A, a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. Is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havala, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. The name of the, uh, it is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Do you know which detail we sometimes miss when we read the creation account? Rivers flow downhill. Eden was a hill. A mountain, even. Both Isaiah and Ezekiel actually refer to this in their prophecies. But it wasn't just any mountain. It was a, it was a temple mount. Listen to Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 13 and 14. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardius, topaz, and diamond. Beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. Now that is, that is part of a prophecy against the king of Tyre. And we can get into that some other time. But he's clearly presented there as, a, as an Adam-like figure. A created being who was to serve as a, as a gatekeeper for the holy mountain of God, the temple mount. He was to do priestly work. So when we come to Psalm 24, verse 3, knowing that because of sin, the answer to those questions is, no one. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Nobody because of the flaming angel swords protecting the most holy place. And yet in verse 4, Psalm 24, 4, there's actually an answer. He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. And then verse 5 is grace poured out. He will receive blessing, grace from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Verse 6 gives the rest of us hope. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. And then in verses 7 through the end, through 10, the worship of God in his holy temple is resumed. But we have a problem. The problem is that all have fallen, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death. And because of this, we are stuck between verses three and verses four, and verse three and verse four. And, and I need to tell you this: verse four, that's not me. And it ain't you. That's not us. Now some of you know the answer to who that is. 
but you're jumping ahead. Slow down a minute and go back to the beginning. In fact, from the garden, we need to fast forward to Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, where the Lord calls Moses to lead his chosen people out into the wilderness. And he says this in Exodus 3, 12. He says, but I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Go get my people and bring them here to me, he says to Moses. And over and over and over, in those first several chapters of Exodus, he says to Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. Where? At Mount Sinai. Now keep your finger here in Psalm 24 and flip back to Exodus chapter 19. I'm going to read the first 14 verses of Exodus 19. They have arrived at the, at the mount, at Mount Sinai. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all the, these words that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot, whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. At Mount Sinai, the Lord had said to the people, You may come this far, but no further. You may come to the edge of the mountain, but don't touch it or you're going to die. Why? Because even though their garments were clean, to borrow a quote from Jesus, they were like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleannesses. The wages of sin is death, in other words. And in the coming years... These people, this generation of Israelite, is going to illustrate just how sinful they really are. And so they need a mediator. They need someone to go between God and his people. And at this time, Moses is the he of Psalm 24, verse 5. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. God, in his grace, allows Moses to ascend his holy hill. So how do we get the generation of verse 6, though? Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. How would that generation receive blessing and, and righteousness from the Lord? Well, the Lord had promised Israel... You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
And the book of Leviticus answers the question, how? Now, it's widely understood that Moses was the one who compiled or wrote down the Pentateuch, that is the, the first five books of the Bible. In Hebrew, it's known as the Torah, the teaching or the law. And if you consider these books together as a collection, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, if you consider them as a collection, you can pick up on some similarities and connections between the books. So Genesis and Deuteronomy are the bookends of the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first and the last. And both of these books end similarly. Genesis ends with Jacob on his deathbed, making a speech and blessing his sons. Deuteronomy ends with Moses on his deathbed, also making a speech and blessing the descendants of the sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes. If you work your way inward from the bookends, the next two books, Exodus and Numbers, are also similar. Exodus is about the people of God being set free from Egypt, coming to Mount Sinai to meet with the Lord and, and building a tabernacle there. Numbers is about the people preparing to move the tabernacle, leave Mount Sinai, following the Lord to the promised land. Then we come to the middle of the Pentateuch. Leviticus, which is different from the other four books. It's a book of law. It's a, it's a bloody book. It's a book full of sacrifices. And within Leviticus, we find the answer to the question, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? In fact, we're going to see as this unfolds that this book, in the process of answering that question, also answers these. How can we draw near to God? How can we may be made pure before God? How can we stay near God? Now, each of those questions are answered in the context of God's law. And so a surface reading of this book, um, it often leaves us with glazed over eyes, simply looking at long and tedious list of laws and rules and regulations. In many cases, they are incredibly and sometimes uncomfortably detailed. And so some outline this book like this. In, in chapters 1 through 7, you have laws of sacrifice. In chapters 8, 9, and 10 are laws pertaining to the, to the priesthood, the Levitical priests. Chapters 11 to 16 are laws of purification. Chapters 17 to 26 are laws that are pertaining to holiness, the holiness code, they're often called. And then the final chapter, chapter 27, contains laws uh, concerning vows. However, and, and I hope that you've picked up on this so far, there's something deeper going on here. This book and the law of God in general is about something more than just simply what the ancient Israelites could and could not do in their daily lives and in their religious practices. There is actually application for 21st century Christians or really for Christians all through the ages, all through this book. For example, Leviticus contains three different types of laws. Moral laws, civil or judicial laws, court laws, and ceremonial laws. Consider in chapter 19, verses 11 and 12, when you read this, you shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, you shall not lie to one another, you shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Those are examples of God's moral law. That's not limited to ancient Israel, is it? We can hear those commands and agree that, that we, as moderns, as Gentiles, as Christians, we're to adhere to those things. We're not to steal. We're not to deal falsely. We're not to lie to one another. Nor are we to swear, so help me God, and then perjure ourselves. There are also laws that are specific to the nation of Israel, civil laws. And so in chapter 25, verses 25 to 28 says this, 
If your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. If a man has no one to redeem it, and then he himself becomes prosperous and finds sufficient means to redeem it, let him calculate the years since he sold it and pay back the balance to the man to whom he sold it and then return to his property. But if he does not have sufficient means to recover it, then what he sold shall remain in the hand of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. In the Jubilee it shall be released, and, we, uh, and he shall return to his property. Now, while there is uh, certainly morality in the concept of that, that is a law for the nation of Israel. That's not the law of the state of Ohio. Once you sell it, it's sold, right? There is no year of Jubilee. I've had my mortgage long enough to know that. And that law was specifically tied to the promise of the land, the promise of land that was made to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. Because in the preceding verses, the verses right before that says this, the land shall not be sold in perpetuity for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land. So there are certain laws for national Israel, civil laws that we're not bound by today. And then there are ceremonial religious laws. These are the laws that are designed to remind them and display to the rest of the world that Israel is a, is a holy nation. It is pure and set apart as a people for his own possession. And this is where verses like, like uh, chapter 19, verse 19 fits in. He says this, you shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. Why? N not because each of those things is inherently bad in and of themselves, but because God's people were called to trust and obey, to live as obviously set apart from, the, from all of the other nations around them to live as different, called out people. Now my prayer is that the distinctions between and the, and the uses of the ceremonial and civil and moral laws, that that would become clearer and clearer as we work our way through this book in the coming weeks or months or however long it takes. So don't dwell on those specific laws right now. They're just quick examples. Instead, keep in mind the big picture of the book of Leviticus um, as we work through this. And let's find some specific application from the entire book this morning. Some things for us to dwell on and to hide in our hearts. So a moment ago, I, I gave you a, a really quick outline that divided the law into five points. Uh, those five points were sacrifice, the priesthood, holiness, purification, and vows. Now I'd like to lay out some application, kind of roughly following the same chapter divisions, but not exactly. So here's what I mean. In Leviticus chapters 1 through 7, as we read about the laws of sacrifice, we should also see glimpses of the grace of God and the cost of our sin. The grace of God and the cost of our sin. As Christians living in the modern world, um, we tend to cheapen grace. We don't pay attention to the cost of our salvation. Incidentally, um, sort of as a side note, this is one of the reasons why a, a few years ago, uh, kind of in, I guess it was in 2020, around the time of... Um, whatever that year was. We started observing weekly communion so that every Lord's Day, here's one of the reasons why we do this, every Lord's Day, you'll hear these words, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. See, our salvation came with a price. 
Hebrews chapter 9 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, and you were purchased by the blood of Christ. And as a result of his death, we are called to proclaim until he comes that we no longer need to bring daily sacrifices to the temple. It is finished. This can tempt us to minimize our sin. But Leviticus reminds us that sin is very costly. In fact, we know that the wages of sin is death. And this book of the law shows us that God is merciful. And he is gracious. And he provides a gracious system of sacrifice where sinners may present a substitute that would die in their place. The sacrificial system shows us the cost of sin. The substitute must come. In fact, in Leviticus, we will see that the substitute must come from the sinner's own herd, his own flock. Imagine every time you sinned, you'd be required to take one of your own lambs and bring it to the priest to present it as a substitute for your own sin, for your sin. But then it's, then it's you, not the priest, who would slit the lamb's throat. It's you who would get blood on your hands, on your feet, your open-toed feet, on your clothes. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 13 tells us, Thus the priest shall make an atonement for him, for the sin which he has committed in any one of these things, and he shall be forgiven. There's a substitute. Under the new covenant, however, Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away your sin forever. Leviticus helps us um, to see these things. It helps us to see in the, in the types and in the shadows of Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God. It takes away the sin of the world. It helps us to see the depths of the grace of God. But it doesn't stop there. Because in chapters 8, 9, and 10, we read about laws pertaining to the priesthood, which is God's gracious provision of a mediator. God's gracious provision of a mediator. Remember, at Mount Sinai, the people were prevented from stepping foot on God's holy hill. They were not permitted to ascend the mountain of the Lord. But God graciously allowed Moses to come up on behalf of the people. In fact, Moses interceded for the people when they so quickly fell into idolatry. As they made a golden calf. Exodus chapter 2. 32 verses 7 to 13 says this, And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation out of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent that he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever." But Moses wasn't going to live forever. He, he went to God on behalf of the people, but 
Moses sinned and died. The people needed a better mediator. And in chapters 8 and 9 of Leviticus, God sets up a system of, of ministers, of priests, who would serve him and his people. And then we're going to see in chapter 10 that these ministers must serve him as he requires, not as they decide for themselves. They to teach all that he commands. In fact, in chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, it says this, You are to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the clean and the unclean, and you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. God graciously provides his people with a mediator. But for us, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it's enacted on better promises. Or in another place in Hebrews, Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for, him, for them. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near in worship. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Chapters 11 through 15 not only lay out God's regulations concerning purification, but they also explain his requirements for worship. His requirements for worship. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. In Exodus chapter 24, after receiving the tablets of the law from the Lord, Moses consecrates the people through worship. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he set young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And so Israel is now God's set apart nation. And as a result, God explains in Leviticus chapters 11 through 15 what he requires of those who will worship him. And it's framed in the context of purity, of clean and unclean. So a key verse here is verse 31 of chapter 15. Thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall dwell in his holy place? The man with a clean heart. The man who is pure. Clean hands, pure heart. And the climax, really, of the book of Leviticus is found in the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the day when all of Israel's sin was forgiven. Sacrifices are made to cleanse the temple, to atone for the sins of the high priest and the people. We will read about this when we get to chapter 16. A scapegoat will be presented as a substitute and Israel's sins would be, would be symbolically placed on the scapegoat, which is then cast into the wilderness, never to be seen again. And so verses 30 and 31 of chapter 16 kind of summarizes the Day of Atonement like this. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you, and you shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. In the book of Leviticus, God graciously shows us 
types and shadows of a better atonement to come. A better and more permanent forgiveness of sin. And he has a name. Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 and 12 says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And then finally, in Leviticus chapters 18 to 27, these chapters teach us how to be holy as he is holy. Be holy as he is holy. We as Christians are not under law, but under grace. But does this mean that we can violate God's law? Does this mean that we can violate God's moral law that grace might increase? May it never be. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, uh, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. How do we do this? How then shall we live? How do we live in holiness in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation? Well, chapter 26 is really the key chapter. Chapter 26 lays out blessings for obedience and, and curses for disobedience. But the ultimate blessing, I believe, is found in verses 11 to 13. Leviticus 26, 11 to 13. God says to his people, I will make my dwelling among you. And my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and will be your God. And you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That you should not be their slaves. And I have broken the bars of your yoke and have made you walk upright. It is the Lord who is working in us. Therefore, therefore my beloved, as you have always obeyed. So now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Father, it is my prayer that as we meditate on your law, Lord, that we would be like David. That we would say the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Father, you can declare us innocent because of the blood of Christ. Remind us of these things in the coming month, Lord, that we, that we might rejoice in your good and perfect law. Rejoice in the fulfillment of it in Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen.